as we come to you this morning grateful for the resurrection that's not just a historical fact to us it's a daily fact that we live with and rely upon every day and so this morning we depend on your resurrection power to open our ears to your word to produce your character in us and to use us as your witnesses to the world. Amen. Just to recap from last week, does anybody remember what the two main points from last week were? What was the gospel and what was the law? Wow, you weren't even here. How do you remember that? Internet. Okay, good for you. The... uh, Two main things we looked at last week were the gospel is crucial because it's what gets us to God, and that when we read the Bible right, when we read the Bible rightly, we have to make a distinction or notice the distinction between the law and the gospel. The law shows us our need for Jesus, and the gospel is what gets us Jesus. This week we're going to be taking that on a step further and seeing how the gospel is what empowers us to change, to be like Jesus. As you, some of you know, I've had the opportunity over the past years to talk to people from all over the place on Skype. Um, I don't do it so much anymore because I don't have time anymore, but um, all three of us have, have talked to all kinds of characters on the internet. And, and I remember one time a young man, a nice, nice guy, Um, who was in a very conservative Christian college, started telling me, because Skype is sort of the modern confessional of the world, started telling me a very serious sexual sin that he was involved in, in, um, with multiple sexual partners. And anyways, it it was, and so I, at that time, you know, you just kind of pull out your bag of fixes, things you've used to kind of, by sin in your own life, like you said, you know, have you, have you told anybody about this? Um, you know, why don't you tell the, the college administration or why don't you tell your parents or something? And he's like, no, no, I couldn't do that. They would just, they would freak out if I did that. And, uh, <laughs> and another guy was the kind of the opposite extreme. Um, he, he was very open about talking about his addiction to pornography and uh, he would just keep falling into it. He would cry. He would tell everybody. He would just keep falling into it. And he would beat himself up. And another guy, another porn addict, actually went to the extreme of throwing his laptop in the river and then went and fished it out a couple days later and let it dry out for a few days and got back on the internet again. And uh, these guys all professed to trust in Jesus, all could tell you the gospel pretty, pretty well, actually surprisingly well. And so at that time it left me kind of puzzled why people can be so close to the gospel, shall we say, without experiencing the power of the gospel in their daily lives. It's a scary thought. So hopefully today we'll uncover some answers and show how the gospel does, how the gospel is the power of God for salvation not just from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. So to do that, I want to back up just a little bit and make sure we understand the difference between justification and sanctification. Because if you confuse the two, it really has bad results. So first of all, what's justification? God's declaration. Mm-hmm. Based on what? Based on Christ. He made him and knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, so justification is us being legally declared righteous in God's sight. What is sanctification? Set apart. Mm-hmm. Yes, sanctification means to be set apart. And when we talk about it, though, what is, what's the normal sense in which we mean? How does it differ from justification? Sanctification is a process. Mm-hmm. Process of what? 
growing from where I was to where I need to be. Amen. That's cool. Also, too, that justification, we have no part in justification. <coughs> we do have some part in sanctification. We'll get more into that as we go on. The, uh, now, can you get into heaven without justification? No. Can you get into heaven without sanctification? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> somebody has, some, some of you have the little slips of paper. Whoever has, and, and please go ahead and find those so you're ready to go when I call, call out your verse. Somebody has Hebrews 12, 14. And if that person would read Hebrews 12, 14, that would be great. Right. 12, 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes by the way to bargain. Okay, so, so what's the, based on that verse, then what's the answer to the question? The question again was, can you get into heaven without sanctification? So no one will see the Lord without sanctification. Yeah. So the, the answer is no. We have to give clarity to that question. It's, it can, Go ahead. That can give, that can come across the wrong way. Okay, maybe this will help. Um, are we going to no. be perfect here? No. No. Is that possible? No. Okay. So, so the understanding is like the, the, the thief on the cross. Yeah. Um, he did have sanctification. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. He was starting that process. Mm -hmm. And yeah. people on their death that are starting the process of sanctification. Mm -hmm. Can't have one without the other. It's, it's obvious. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you quit righteous. Their desire is to be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. And do we even see evidence of change in the thief's life in the, the, the brief hour or whatever that he was a converted man before he died? Um, are all Christians equally justified? In other words, are we all equally yes. righteous to God's sight? Yes. Thank you. Um, are all Christians equally sanctified? No way. No. And as we were already talking about, um, it's not possible to become perfect here, but somebody has Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. If you would read that, it kind of shows the balance there. Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Good. So we see there the balance that Paul's saying, I'm not, even Paul was saying, I'm not perfect yet, so if Paul's not, we, we can be pretty sure we're not perfect either. Um, but he's, he's not using that as just a pillow. Uh, nobody's perfect, so I'm just going to sit back and wait for the rapture. He is saying, I'm pressing on, striving to be more like Jesus there. Now, there's two opposite extremes that we can go to when we're talking about this subject. And it can apply to justification as well. Uh, what are the two extremes? Two extremes in sanctification? Mm -hmm. In talking about this, or in talking about justification? I've arrived. Mm -hmm. okay. And so in other words, would it be you don't even realize there is such a thing, but you are in it. The carnal Christian side. Uh -huh. And then of course the, the other side. That's an oxymoron, right? There right. Isn't such thing. Exactly. The um, we might call the, the terms we usually use to describe these are legalism and license. Um, so, in, when we're talking about justification, what does legalism look like? Uh, rules. Mm -hmm. uh, rules, uh, trying to earn God's favor mm -hmm. by a righteous, trying to turn our way into heaven by our righteousness. Um, what would license look like with justification? You can do anything you want. All you got to do is ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It's an abuse of grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Um, Somebody's got Romans 3, verses 20 to 23. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
So that's pretty clear that <coughs> both legalism and license are wrong, that are good works by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, and all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. So our, um, we do have a problem, and our own works are not going to solve that problem. So then, just tweaking it slightly, what does legalism look like um, with respect to sanctification? Kind of a works righteousness mindset. Okay. Exactly, more rules. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> what does license look like with regard to sanctification? Like your world. <laughs> well, you might say it this way. Um, a licensed person that has license makes you know, I don't really need to change, you know, because I'm declared righteous before God. I'm okay the way I am. Whereas a person who's approaching sanctification from the law's point of view would say, yeah, I do need to change, and I'm going to use the law to fix myself. Somebody has Galatians 3, verses 1 to 5, which is probably the most important passage we will read on this subject today. If you get one passage, this is the one to listen to. Galatians 3, 1 to 5. Mm -hmm. Well, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing and faith? Good, thank you. So the Galatians had trusted Jesus for their justification, but then they had the idea that now we got to use the law to change ourselves. And Paul was calling them back saying, hey, it's not one program for justification and another one for sanctification. It's relying on the Spirit for everything. That's kind of our default. Mm -hmm. we, we very easily mm -hmm. fall into that. I mean, that's why, you know, and that's why we pound, it should pound the gospel mm -hmm. out constantly and keep that in our in our mind because without that, without focusing on that, we do fall right into that. Doing these things and to why is God? Why is that our default? It's a good question. It'll become more clear as we go on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's that's important. So as we look at sanctification, we're going to talk about the motive, the motivation for sanctification, and then we're going to talk about the method of sanctification. Because if we get the motive wrong, the method will become wrong almost automatically. So let's talk about bad people first. Why, since we're in tax season now, if you're just talking about your average pagan neighbor that, that uh, cheats on their income tax, what are their reasons for cheating on their tax? What are the reasons people cheat on it? They don't like what the government does with their money. So Amen. Yeah. Preach it. So more than pays taxes. I paid them early. <laughs> Any other reasons you can think of? Not that you need more, but... Okay. Now, some of your neighbors pay their taxes. Some of your non-Christian neighbors pay their taxes. And they're honest about it. What is their motivation for doing that? Keeping their children. Okay, afraid of getting audited. <laughs> okay, okay. What are some other reasons that might? Their their moral compass. Okay. They have conscience. Mm -hmm. Self righteousness. Okay, so they feel good about themselves when they do it. Okay, maybe some of them think of it as being their patriotic duty or something. You know, they get benefits from the government. So are one sort of. Yeah, yeah, they can pay more if they want to. Yeah. They do have that, that line in some of the tax forms. Huh? Where do you think if you want to make it a contribution to the national debt or something like Oh, well. <laughs> Thanks. Um, now, as a Christian, what is a Christian's motivation for paying taxes? Peace. Recognizing the authority that God has placed over him. Okay. God says pay taxes. Okay. Honoring the Lord by being honest. Okay, okay. Depends on what their motivation is. Yeah. <laughs> what are some other reasons that they might have? Uh, 
Does anyone feel guilty? Okay. Okay. Let's put some of these down. So we're talking about Christian motivation. Okay. So I um, don't want to feel guilty. Let's see. Okay. Um, what are some other reasons that a Christian might have for to improve their standing before God? Okay. Now that was that. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. But <laughs> what are some other motivations that might Christian might have? He's already said his story. Mm -hmm. Okay, obey God. Okay. To honor God. Honor God. Okay. <clears throat> now. Look at these and think, and if you think of more, we'll put them up here. But are any of these motives motives that a Catholic or a Mormon or even a Muslim could say that they have for paying their taxes? To do the all of them would not. Those would not qualify. All those all of those deviations of religion could have the same motives. So what is the distinctively Christian motive for paying your taxes? For following God's word. Oh, and the, the other religions would say the same thing. Um, Catholics, you know, they have the same Bible we do. Mormons sort of have the Bible. And, and um, or Muslim. just put it better, we're doing what Jesus told us to do. Mm -hmm. Get to Caesar, let's do Caesar. Get to God, let's do God. Mm -hmm. But you know, like a, a good Catholic, would say exactly the same thing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> somebody else. That's okay. <laughs> Maybe the gospel sets us apart. How? Oh. You know the gospel has to be the answer, so you're just... Yes. Right? <laughs> That's what we're talking about today. So. <laughs> I think Mark looking at So he's only half right. Partial credit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let me ask the question a different way. Okay. I'll take it even a notch further. Um, because if you think about it, at first it looks like the Catholic and the Mormon actually would have more motivation to obey the Bible than we do. Here's why. Because the way they see it is your justification depends on your sanctification. Okay, So, so you have sanctification. Oh, it's based on the just yeah, right. So to justification. Mm -hmm. that's well, it. the more you give, the better you are. The more you obey, the better you are. They would say, and so um, they would say, you know, your entry into heaven is dependent on your sanctification. Uh, your justification is dependent on your sanctification. Whereas we would look at it this way: that your sanctification is based on your justification. And so, if you are justified, you will. Not perfectly in this life, but you will be sanctified. And so our entry into heaven is dependent on our perfect justification, not our imperfect sanctification. So, but if you look at it, you would think that these people would actually wind up being better people than we are because they get, their eternity depends on it, right? It, on their own performance. Whereas ours depends on the perfect righteousness of Jesus. So why is it how is it that the gospel of done, it's finished, motivates us to do more than the law of do does? Why is it that the gospel doesn't lead us to laxity? The difference between those two, one has the indwelling and power of the Holy Spirit, one does not. Mm -hmm. We are doing it through that indwelling and power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so why is it that God gives the Holy Spirit to these people but not to these people? Because you just said one group has the Holy Spirit and one yes. doesn't. So, so here's these people over here trying really hard 
why isn't God going to give the Holy Spirit to them? Why is he, like, like we just read in, in Galatians, does the they Spirit have, come with they have not the works been, of the law or before, by hearing of faith? He says clearly it's by hearing of faith, but why? They have not been chosen. It's the effects of the call. The effects of the call. One has been regenerated, one has not. Right. Right. It's it's God. Yeah, yeah, they know it's based on Jesus. They're, they've rejected, He's already did it, they've so. rejected the completed work of Christ. <laughs> yeah, we're getting closer there. Let me read this as a quote uh, for you from uh, John Piper's book, uh, Future Grace, which is a, a great book on sanctification. I'm just giving you a few highlights from it this morning, but I do highly recommend that. This is a quote that will kind of help bring what we're saying here uh, into clarity. Works wants the thrill of feeling itself overcome an obstacle. Faith wants the thrill of feeling God overcome an obstacle. Works longs for the joy of being glorified as capable and smart and strong. Faith longs for the joy of seeing God glorified for his capability, mm. strength, and wisdom. In its religious form, works accepts the challenge of morality, conquers its obstacles through great exertion, and offers the victory to God as payment for his approval and recompense. Faith also accepts the challenge of morality, but only as an occasion to become the instrument of God's power. And when the victory is achieved, faith rejoices that all the glory and thanks belong to God. So kind of another way to, to summarize what we're saying here is the reason why the Holy Spirit is given to those who hear with faith and not to those that works of the law is because what's the Holy Spirit like to do? Glorify God. Whereby, particularly, the Father. Jesus. The oh, Holy Spirit points to Jesus, always exalts Jesus. And so, the Holy Spirit's power only comes to those seeking righteousness by faith, because the Holy Spirit is only interested in exalting Jesus. And, and if the Holy Spirit helped us do this, he would be exalting, helping us exalt us. And the Holy Spirit is not interested in doing that. So that brings it down to how the motivation determines the method. If our motivation for sanctification is my glory, we will resort to works one way or another to do that. And it will end in failure because the Holy Spirit will not empower us. The Holy Spirit is not interested in sharing the glory of Jesus with anyone else. But if our motivation is God's glory, then we come to Jesus in faith and allow him to do his work in us. And the Holy Spirit does empower that because it lifts up Jesus. Jerry Bridges, in his, there's a book, a daily devotional book, it's kind of a compilation of Jerry Bridges' <coughs> writings, he's written a lot on sanctification, and um, it's, a, it's a good book as well, I do recommend it, <coughs> because it's <coughs> short, <coughs> excuse me, some of the short um, highlights of his writings, and it's called Holiness Day by Day, and he says, God wants us to walk in obedience, not victory. Obedience is oriented toward God. Victory is oriented towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, let me show how... Do you have a question? I was just going to say, um, how does that work itself out? Because you mentioned the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. How does that work itself out for an Old Testament believer who did not have the Holy Spirit? Because there was still justification in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. Had you thought of an answer yet? <laughs> They, they were still justified by faith. They were right. just, they're still justification by faith. And, and I think, because you said it earlier, our motivation, well, you didn't say this, but our motivation is faith in Jesus, who God is and how awesome he is. So there's dependence upon him mm -hmm. as opposed to dependence upon me. Mm -hmm. And so even though we have, the, we have even more so the promise of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do that mm -hmm. and who gives us grace to do that, um, but for us to have the Holy Spirit Our justification is not dependent upon the Holy Spirit indwelling in silence. Right. Because that, because we want to make sure that we understand Old okay. Testament believers, mm -hmm. they did not have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He would come. He would come and go. Mm -hmm. But they would still be justified by faith alone mm -hmm. in Messiah alone in the future. Abel and Abraham. Yes. Etc. Yeah. But would that point towards? An indirect reference to dispensationalism? No, because um, even 
covenant theologians would say old dispensation, new dispensation. They would say in the old covenant, um, uh, there was the promise of the Holy Spirit. But that's part of the aspect of the new covenant. Actually, it would give more credence even to new covenant theology. <laughs> that's what it would do. Because it would say we are in the new covenant because we have the Holy Spirit right now. Which is what I believe. We are in the new covenant. We're not benefiting from the new covenant. We, we are in the new covenant. We are in it right now because we have the promise of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who writes the law of God upon our hearts. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, no, that's, that's a good point to bring up. We might say that the Holy Spirit is one of the things that follows from our justification now mm -hmm. as, as New Covenant believers. Now, let's say you were talking to somebody that's a, a drug addict, okay? <clears throat> Bad drug addict. Just to pick this in here. And let's say you told them, gave them the following basic advice. Um, telling you, know, first, admit you're powerless to change. Um, and then believe that Jesus can change you. Are you talking about a drug addict that is um, proclaims to be born again, or either way, you're, you're kind of you're just going over, you're going over some basic points with somebody that's a drug addict, just trying to make sure where they're at. And let's see, tell them you know to believe Jesus can change you, uh, yield your will and life to Jesus. Um, examine yourself and confess your sins to Jesus. Okay. Um, ask Jesus to change you. or offended for your addiction or, or whatever. Make restitution if possible. Okay. This is a trick question. Yeah. Um, then um, build your relationship with Jesus through prayer. Trap. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, such confidence. Such confidence. Hmm? Such confidence. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> share, um, share these truths with other addicts. Help them. <clears throat> okay. So, you're already getting ahead of me here, but is this the gospel? No. Yes, it is. But yes, it is. Yes, exactly. This is this is AA with Jesus plugged in as a higher power here. Mm -hmm. So what is wrong with this? I mean, there's a lot of good stuff that we would agree with. So what's wrong with this? Well, being a drug addict mm -hmm. is heaven compared to hell. So you're better off being a drug addict than you're still in hell. So it needs to be pointed out that he's headed for hell and the wrath of God is on him. That's God's there. There's a there's a couple up there that I'm. For me, anyway, when I look at this, these steps here, okay. unless a person realizes that they are their own worst enemy, that, and I think that's probably admit that they're powerless, but I'm not really sure, they have to admit, they have to personalize that they are the barrier that keeps them from this uh, re restoration process. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which one of those in I, there. You're right. That, that's actually one of the problems in AA is they see the problem is not me, myself. Right. The problem is my addiction 
or, or other people that cause me to do what it is that I'm doing. They'll try and blame shift. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if I see that up there, but that would be a key component in any type yeah, these, of those again, I'm not, these are not the way it should be. This is what AA would okay. say, the cure. And so right. I'm not holding that, this up as something that is complete at all. This is just what, what they would say is the it's the AA gospel with Jesus plugged in as a higher power here. Which, okay. Uh, what else is wrong? What else is missing here? Um, well, it, it, taking what's missing, in not the gospel not being there, is when he talks about Jesus here and Jesus there, mm -hmm. um, does not talk about God, who he is, his righteousness, his standard. And the Holy Spirit to, to guide mm -hmm. him. Yeah, his wrath, mm -hmm. our sinfulness. Exactly, there's, there's no cross here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Jesus? What did he do? Right. Exactly. The, uh, with AA, the addiction, freedom from the addiction becomes actually the God, the idol. Thing. The Jesus is just, Jesus or the higher power or whatever is just a means to the end, not the end himself. He's, um, the, their goal is not... Heaven, as you said, their goal is to is just getting free from their addiction. And there's no mention of the cross because the way they look at it, God is not offended with them. God's just kind of a buddy there, wants to help them, mm -hmm. and they need to let him in and let him help. Addiction is the problem to be removed, um, but not a sin to be punished. So when we're talking with somebody or preaching to ourselves, the first question when I ask them is why do you want to change? Because until we get the motivation correct, the method will be flawed. So what methods, in looking at this, it give you a starter, but what, what methods do non-Christians use to improve themselves? If they've got some kind of a, a sin problem in their life and they just want to fix themselves, what are, the, what are their tools that they have? Why Joel Osteen? <laughs> <laughs> Resolution. <laughs> Resolution is certainly one I've just tried it. Formulas, psychology. Mm -hmm. Go to the therapist. Self esteem. Yeah, self esteem. Mm -hmm. But but it really dodges the ultimate issue, and that's a heart change. And I think that's ultimately where mm -hmm. we have to go with any of this. Unless their heart is changed, <clears throat> any program is just going to be man's ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have Jesus, they're going to hell. Mm -hmm. And it's temporary. Mm -hmm. The trouble with pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps is we'll be, become proud. You know, look at, hey, look how, I, look how I improved my life. And then mm -hmm. you're worse off than you were before. So um, the, you mentioned resolutions, which is good because um, that was that was one thing that troubled me in the, in the movie, um, Courageous. Um, it's just, um, I, I, I like the movie. Uh, we got a copy, of, you can borrow it if you, if you want to actually, Mark's got it now, but, but if you can borrow it from Mark. <laughs> but uh, um, it, it's a good movie and it does have um, some gospel in it, but the, the, the emphasis on resolution and, and Kind of did, I wish that they had emphasized more what gave the power, what gives the power to do. Yeah, that. it's still self motivation at some level. It's still self that is doing the work. <coughs> it's something to. It's an Armenian church too. Oh, anyways, it, it's it's. The Armenians can proclaim the gospel just as strong as Calvinists can. I mean, Calvinists can proclaim the gospel just as strong as Armenians can. Yeah. We can and you can get saved. We can be one. We're, we're all saved by Armenian doctrine, one way or another. <laughs> And, and, and we're all in danger of even taking pride in our Calvinism or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, yeah. so there's, there's a, a constant yeah. thing to remind us that ourselves that it's not us and our commitment to our principles or whatever that's going to change us at the end of the day. Now, what are some, you know, we talked about sort of the secular change things. Now, what are some kind of Christian tools to change that may not um, that can, that we can be in danger of using without the gospel to try to change ourselves. Let's say it that way. Um, there's a song 
when I was a kid because I heard in Sunday school or <coughs> the radio or something, you know, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, 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 right? Yeah. Now, th is there some truth to that? Yeah? But what's wrong with that? You have to be a believer for that to be effective. Mm -hmm. And what is your motivation? Yeah, that's what I would call motivation. motivation. Can I go back to motivation again there? So what are some other spiritual disciplines that are involved in our sanctification, but that if we're not careful, we can use them as just kind of men-centered tools to fix ourselves up? What are some other things? Reading your Bible, praying, what are some other things? Reading books written by... No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, reading books like by C.J. Mahaney and mm -hmm. Piper. And just reading good Christian yeah, books. Yeah, reading good books or biographies yeah. or whatever. Uh -huh. Going to the church service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hearing the gospel preached or hearing the word preached, yeah. Okay, what else? Paying your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Going out and, and serving somehow. Mm -hmm. Serving. Missions trips. Yeah. yeah, you have to, you can't just keep soaking in. At some point, you have to start going out and, mm -hmm. and doing mm -hmm. something with the knowledge that you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Uh, let's see, what about fasting? That would be another example of something that has, a, has a, it, it's related to our sanctification, a spiritual mm -hmm. discipline, um, but that if we rely upon it or use it as a tool um, rather than using it as something to point us to the gospel, using it as something to achieve self-righteousness. We can misuse the spiritual discipline. Here is something written by a man named Craig Parton. I think a lot of us can relate to what he says here. I experienced what happens when law and gospel are not understood and thus not distinguished. My Christian life, truly begun by grace, was now being perfected on the treadmill of the law. My pastors did not end their sermons by demanding that I recite the rosary or visit Lourdes this week in order to unleash God's power. Instead, I was told to yield more, pray more, hear about unbelievers more, read the Bible more, get involved with the church more, love my wife and kids more. Not until some 20 years later did I understand that my Christian life had come to center around my life, my obedience, my yielding, my Bible verse memorization, my prayers, my zeal, my witnessing, and my sermon application. I had advanced beyond the need to hear the cross preached to me anymore. Of course, we all knew that Jesus had died for our sins, and none of us would ever argue that we were trying to merit salvation. But something had changed. God was a father, all right, but a painfully demanding one. I was supposed to show that I had cleaned up my life and was at least grateful for all the gifts that had been bestowed. The gospel, the gospel was critical for me in the beginning, critical now to share with others, and still critical to get me into heaven, but it was of little other value that evangel and evangelicalism was missing. So, as we said before, the Holy Spirit will never honor our attempts at self-improvement, even if we're using legitimate, biblical, spiritual disciplines to achieve self-improvement. The spiritual disciplines are all meant to be pointers to Jesus, to the gospel, not standalone sanctifiers. Um, The, uh, just I mean, like an example would be, of course, our purpose in memorizing scripture is to remind, remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel, um, not to directly, you know, just memorizing scripture doesn't sanctify you. It's the gospel that is the power of God for salvation and for sanctification. But memorizing scripture can be useful to preach the gospel to ourselves. Or um, Another example would be the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, the, taking the elements itself doesn't have any sanctifying power itself, but it reminds us, if we're thinking about what we're doing and the meaning of the elements, it reminds us of the gospel. And so in that way, it can help in our sanctification. Now, what about... I mean, like I had a, I had a, a father say to me a number of years ago, he was saying, you see, it seems like when I dress nicely that I act better. Hmm. What is the relationship between externals and our sanctification? Um, another example would be um, John Piper, when he was teaching on sanctification, he was saying when people come to me for counseling if they're struggling with depression, one of the first things that I'll ask them is, how much sleep do you get at night? And if they're, like I said, most people 
are getting a couple hours less a night than they actually need and go home and get eight hours sleep for the next two weeks and come back and we'll talk again. Um, and often that helps a lot. Um, so there is a relationship between physical things. You know, or another example would be getting exercise. Does that change our mood and the way we look for things? Or uh, John Pepper again talked about how years ago he gave up eating sugar because he noticed that his, his blood sugar was spiking. He would get grouchy and crappy. And, and so he just gave up eating sugar. And, and Okay, so what's the relationship between that and sanctification? Um, our diet or, or um, things like, you know, avoiding tel uh, television that's uh, defiling or um, homeschooling your kids, all these things can, can relate to and have an impact on sanctification. But what's the relationship between these externals and sanctification? Do these externals actually create sanctification? What do you think? It's having an internal perspective. What do you mean? You can, it's not wrong to do those things. It's not wrong to not eat sugar. It's not wrong to exercise. It's not wrong to watch television. It's not wrong to do any of those things. Um, uh, well, it's getting off the subject as long as your conscience is violated. Um, but it's having a true perspective, knowing that those things aren't going to last, that you're, that those things are going to be gone when you're with the Lord, <coughs> but still, it's not able to do those things. Okay. It's a matter of better or best, really. You know, uh, you can feed yourself garbage, or you can choose to not feed yourself garbage, whether visually or in your diet or whatever. And, and, and through all that, hopefully, your life will even last longer because you will be healthier. You'll be of more use in the kingdom. You'll be more productive in your life. And uh, the fruit will be richer out of your life. There's a, if you become a sloth and lazy and fat, you're going to, you're going to shorten your life and, and uh, Reduce your effectiveness for Christ. Those are those are good, and I agree with what you're saying. But where I was, where I was trying to go with that is, are these things that unbelievers can do? Sure. I mean, to, you know, uh, and some of them do. You know, right? Some of them are disciplined, and, and they'll they'll take care of their bodies, to, and they may uh, have the trappings externally of conservatism. So here's the thing: they kind of tough question. If, if an unbeliever can do them, does that mean a Christian shouldn't do them? No. Right. Okay. But why do we do them? Again, what's our motivation for doing them? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And can these things change the heart? No. No, they cannot. Um, we choose them, be as Christians we choose them because our hearts are changed, not to change our heart. And so... Does that mean, for example, then, though, that let's say you're a parent and you got a kid that wants to stay up too late, um, or they want to have food that you know is going to make them crabby, or they want to watch junky television or something? Does that mean that as a parent, you should just say, well, you know, they're not they're not a Christian. I'll just let them follow their heart. Um, <laughs> how does that work? No. But the danger then as parents it can be that we can mistake the child's external conformity because we have to set boundaries for them. We can, but we can mistake the, the external conformity with the heart conversion. And if we do that, then we've just made a Pharisee and not a, a Christian. Mm -hmm. So um, on a, a book, if you're a parent or a parent gets um, shepherding a child's heart by a Ted Tripp, and he has another book, um, Instructing a Child's Heart, he wrote with his wife. Both of these are very good giving balanced advice on how to train to, to uh, in the process of working with your kids, show them their heart condition, point them toward the gospel, and yet at the same time set healthy boundaries for them. So mm -hmm. a, a good book that I recommend if you're um, working through that. Now this is where you were already going. Um, our primary mo motivation should be faith in God's promises um, this, is, again, is drawing heavily from John Piper's book, Future Grace. 
Uh, he points out that no one sins out of duty. Hmm. He, he never sin- um, somebody was talking about the, the, uh, the story Jesus told about the treasure in the field. Um, nobody, when they find the treasure in the field, says, oh, no, I hate it when this happens. Now I've got to go sell everything I've got and bu- buy the treasure. Um, <laughs> um, because it's a treasure. And the problem, the reason why we don't pursue holiness is because we don't believe that there's a treasure waiting for us. We don't, um, another quote from John Piper is, we don't yield to the offer of sandwich meat when we can smell the, sa- the steak sizzling on the grill. So our chief enemy is the lie that sin will make our future happier, and our chief weapon is the truth that God will, that God will make our future happier. Amen. In the early 70s, um, Stanford University did an experiment with some kids. You can watch um, repeats of the experiment on YouTube now where they took a, uh, kids, young kids like four years old, put them in a room without any distractions and just a marshmallow in front of them and said, if you wait here for 15 minutes, we'll give you two marshmallows. But if you, or you can just eat it now, but if you wait and don't eat it, um, you can have another marshmallow. And so, it's great. It, it's just classic watching the videos, but um, only about a third of the kids made it 15 minutes without mm-hmm. eating. And what was interesting was, as they studied them after that, the ones that were able to wait, even at that young age, wound up having more successful, balanced um, lives afterwards because they had learned to de- delay gratification to wait for something better. Mm-hmm. And mm. that has big ramifications for us as Christians in our pursuit of sanctification. If we take the bait of sin and, and get the instant gratification, we miss out on a much bigger, um, more lasting joy in the end. And when we have this this perspective, it gets our focus off of, of sanctification as being just avoiding doing wrong, like Ed was talking about, and gets it onto pursuing what's best. Because even there's good things, like this was kind of the point of Jim's message last Sunday, was there's good things in our lives that we have to give up sometimes for things that are better. So it's not just about giving up sin or avoiding sin, it's about pursuing better things. And... Well, I'm going to go ahead and try to do this quickly. Um, I'm, I'm rushing through all kinds of material, but um, hopefully you're getting something from what I'm saying. It's not just confused babbling. Um, what is the role of um, emotions and desires in sanctification? Since, um, since we're after heart change, not just changing the externals, should we wait until our heart abhors evil before we stop doing evil? And on the other side, should we wait until we desire good before we do good? So are you talking about feelings now? I'm talking about emotional yeah. feelings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a good basis for making those kind of decisions. <laughs> if, you, if you do right, you'll feel right. There's some truth to that too. Yeah. Well, obedience is demanded. Whether you feel good about it or not. Right. <laughs> but I mean, here I'll, I'll just I'll play the devil's advocate here. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. <coughs> God loves a cheerful giver, so does that mean, you know, if you, if you don't want to give, if you feel unhappy about giving, you shouldn't give? Mm-hmm. Or um, another example would be, you know, if you, if you just don't feel like um, telling people about Jesus, sh- should you wait until you do? Should you wait until it just, mm-hmm. just kind of bubbles out of you? No way. Okay. Um, taking you to a more extreme example, um, if you want, you know, if you feel like snorting dope or watching pornography, should you just go ahead and do it? I think we would all say, no way. But, um, or another example, something that we deal with maybe more frequently is, you, you know, if you just get up and you don't feel like reading your Bible or doing family devotions, would it be hypocritical if you went, if you did that? No. But here's the question, because some people actually do wrestle with this, and you probably will at one time or another. Is it legalism to do right if we don't feel like doing right? Is that legalism? Because... Um, there's in our no many times you don't feel like it but as soon as you do you're so glad you did like coming to church you don't always feel like coming to church but you come to church and then when you get here you're so glad you did Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what then do we do with our feelings when our feelings are contrary to what we know we should do what do we do with them how do we handle them what are our choices 
Amen. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's where the trust comes in, where you trust and, and you yield to the Holy Spirit. And you point it towards Jesus because you know that's right. Mm-hmm. And you trust. Mm-hmm. They drive 75 miles. We drive 20, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Talk about not feeling like coming to church. Right? Well, <laughs> I think that's the danger in emotionalizing Scripture mm-hmm. and, and reducing different passages of Scripture into an emotional type of a thing rather than more of a black and white logical thing. Mm-hmm. You know? And you know, the society's really into, you know, has made everything emotional rather than logic taking precedence. Now emotions take precedence. And we should have, we should have affection for righteousness. We should, we should not just do righteousness out of duty like we just talked about. We shouldn't, it, it should smell like steak sizzling on the grill to us. Mm. We should love righteousness and hate wickedness. But when we don't, um, what you said is correct. We, we don't just ignore the feelings. We don't just uh, press on do good out of duty. We don't just try to externally alter our feelings, you know, by putting on some John Philip Sousa music and, yes, we're going to do this. Um, what's that? Folk music. Folk music, yeah, right. Um, the... <laughs> I was kidding. I <laughs> Lawrence Falk. Yeah. But That's instead, true. we can actually wind up using even our our simple lack of affection for righteousness. We can even use that as a springboard to take us back to the cross, to the gospel, and fuel us for worship. Um, for example, that would you know, let's say you you get up uh, in the morning and you just you really don't feel like reading your Bible. First, you just kind of maybe you're tired or maybe you're upset about something and like uh, Glenda said come to Jesus with that feeling mm-hmm. and say you know Jesus I, I should feel like I should have a love for you right now welling up in my heart I should feel like reading your word and have a hunger for your word <coughs> why? because um, be- exactly be- <laughs> <laughs> because because I mean first of all because I'm commanded to but taking it to the gospel, and Jesus, you even died for people who don't love your word like me. You died for people who are more concerned about my fatigue or my uh, bad hair day or whatever. And, and taking it back, reminding yourself of the gospel, preaching the gospel to that particular sin of lovelessness or apathy or whatever you want to call it, and saying, Jesus, you died for that, and I worship you for, and thank you that. Um, your spirit is within me and is changing me. And so taking even the, the, the lack of emotion or the negative emotions and using those as a reminder to go back to the cross. Am I making sense? Yeah, but if you if you wait for a feeling to yeah. obey, you may be waiting a long time. Exactly. <laughs> it's like he's your best friend. It's not like he's really clueless about how you feel. You know what I mean? He knows how you feel. There's, There's another, something that talking to the Lord about it. Mm-hmm. We, can, we can even praise him that as Jesus, you came and experienced all the same temptations that I've experienced. Um, you know exactly how it feels to get up in the morning and not feel like serving God, but yet you did perfectly all the times. Um, you know, so praising him for his active righteousness on our behalf as well. And uh, then we focusing on the joy set before us. Jesus, we focused on the joy set before him as he went to the cross. Um, John Piper has a great book called When I Don't Desire God. It goes into this much more uh, Hmm. depth. Um, Okay, we'll we'll skip that section, and we're just going to go on to uh, the remaining. A lot of you have verses left, and what I wanted to do was just give us a few minutes to actually practice how would we preach the gospel to ourselves or to others in, in various situations. Let's say you or somebody you were talking to was a, a husband who was angry because his wife was being really crabby with him, and you wanted to know. <laughs> okay. She's pointing at Dave here, so I guess. Are you crabby? <laughs> no, I'm crabby. You're okay. crabby. He's angry. I'm okay. angry. Okay. So how should we help Dave here then? Um, and and uh, um, what would be, how would the gospel help Dave with his, I'm glad we can pick on you, Dave. How would the gospel uh, help a, a, a husband who's struggling with anger to um, 
kind of the love of Jesus Christ. <coughs> First of all, let's just remember last week, what would the law say to Dave? Or Dave? The law would just say, love your wife, be nice to her. Mm -hmm. no. Get so, over it. Get, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Forgive her, right? And so, mm -hmm. so now what's the gospel going to say to him? Uh, love Jesus and clean up Somebody has Ephesians 5, 25 to 30. Here we go. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her with the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also... Loves their own wives, loves their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Good. So by seeing Christ's love for us, even when we were crappy with him, and a lot of worse things with him, <coughs> um, that in turn empowers us to be, to, to uh, have that same love for people around us who sin against us. Um, let's say we have, <coughs> to pick another sin, maybe somebody we struggle with, let's say you've got uh, an unsaved neighbor who's really nice, a really moral person, and you want to, you know you should witness to them, but you're afraid to. So what would the law tell us? Get over it. <laughs> go, go, yeah, go, go tell them about Jesus, you know, right? That's good. So what would the gospel say to us? How would the gospel help us? <coughs> face your face your fears and present the gospel. That's still law. I know. No. It's okay. No. It's, you, see, you can see how naturally it comes to us to just think about law and so thinking deeper. How would the gospel empower us? Somebody's got Luke chapter twenty-two verses twenty-one to thirty-four. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. I'm sorry, I gave you the right. 31 to 34, I'm sorry. No, that didn't sound very good. Yeah. Okay. Which one? 31? 31 to 34, yeah. 31 to 34. Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Uh, Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. So here we see the good news for Peter and people like Peter who deny Jesus. And we do that all the time. And we see that Jesus is actually praying and extending grace to Peter even in advance of his sin. And so as we remember that, um, that Jesus even died for people who deny him, like me, and people who um, blush to own his cause, then that creates, that, that empowers us, that awakens within us um, love and worship and wonder that then does empower us to go out and share the gospel even when we are scared in the midst of our fear. And um, another one, let's pick, pick one more here. Let's see. Um, okay. Okay, this is a good one. Let's say another kind of fear here. Let's say that you've got something, some kind of scary physical symptoms all of a sudden. You know, you some, something's wrong with your body, and you're not sure what's causing it. You think know, maybe I've got cancer or something, and, and you're dealing with fear right then. Okay, what's the law say? Fear not. Yeah, fear not. You know, trust God. You know everything will work out okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, how would the gospel? Yeah, those are those are things we those are good uh, things as well. But that's still kind of kind of law things there. Um, although hopefully the elders would remind you of the gospel when they pray for you. So 
that would be time back. That's great. Yeah. Be thankful and joyful because you might be getting a lot closer to heaven quicker than you realize. Okay, now you're getting closer. Yeah. Okay. You're getting uh, closer. Comfort, uh, comfort verses, Second Corinthians. Uh, if you comfort, you've been comforted. You comfort. Okay, good. You're getting closer. Yeah. Somebody's got Romans 8 to 28 to 32. And we know that in all things God works for good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For though God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many. Many brothers, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then should we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us <coughs> all, know how he not also, along with him, graciously gave us all things. Mm -hmm. That is just a beautiful chain of, of um, logic there that Paul gives, encouraging us. And, and the last verse she read, verse 32, is I think John Piper's favorite verse in the whole Bible, if my memory is correct. Um, he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? And that's the gospel right there, and how, because we remember that we deserve hell. We deserve a lot worse than cancer. We deserve hell, and God's given us his son. He's delivered us from hell and given us his son he, um, at the cost of his son's life. And so, you know, dealing with the cancer is just small fry to God compared to dealing with hell. And so we can trust him with the small things like cancer because of the big things that he's already done. So, well, we shouldn't fear that to die again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing. <laughs> so, um, Sorry, then I had to skip stuff, but I hope that, does anybody have questions or clarifications that you'd like to make from the 15? So either I've confused you all or I, or you all have, have understood it perfectly. It's probably the, the uh, former, but um, even at a few minutes after this message is over and I start my perfectionistic self-critique of my message, depending on, <laughs> depending on how many compliments I get. <laughs> Don't talk to Daniel. Can I, can I just, um, say something? Okay. I went on uh, the, the Facebook page and I downloaded and printed the article that you had recommended. Mm -hmm. And so if there's other people that, because I mean, when I, I read through it and it did help me understand kind of where you were going to be going today. So I would just recommend if there's other people that have a computer. Okay. What if you have a Facebook? Yeah, talk to Mark or I can, or I can e email you the link or whatever. So it's a, yeah. a five-page article by Jerry Bridges. Mm -hmm. Then you're blessed. Uh, send it to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I can yeah. probably figure it out from the blog. I can post it on the blog. Okay. Did my best to do that today. Should okay. be in touch. Okay. So Jim will, will post it on the church blog also, which if you go to firstsoutherncottonwood.com and click on it's news yeah. up there at the top. There'll be a link to it there. Um, so even when my self-critique of the message begins in a few minutes, mm -hmm. I, if, if I feel like I'm a, if I feel like I did a great job, I take myself, you know, and start to be proud. I can take myself back to the gospel and say, Jesus, that was only your grace. It wasn't anything of me. Or if I, on the other side, I, you know, I really botched it up today again. You know, if you're a loser, Daniel, when are you going to get this together? Then I can, then I'll I can keep go. you from thinking that way. <laughs> and the gospel helps me there also, because I can remember it is not uh, my work that saves me or the, my listeners, but it's the work of Jesus. And mm -hmm. So to summarize what we talked about today, our motive must be God's glory and our method must be centered in the gospel. The disciplines point us toward the gospel and the externals flow from the gospel. Mm -hmm. So next week, the last week... Uh, we will see how the gospel then creates church unity and what the potential dangers for the gospel-centered movement may be. Uh, um, let's see. Would somebody be willing to close in prayer?